and we are going to do this whole blockchain sharding talk. I probably butchered your name. Can you say it for me? Uh, Chen Wan. I didn't butcher the name. I just, I, I, I probably just can't hear how I butchered the name is, is actually the way to say it. I can check it. Okay. Um, so we are um, going to be talking about blockchain sharding here. So if you're out there and you're interested in blockchain sharding, what it is, is it a buzzword? Is it more than a buzzword? Um, is Cheng a buzzword? We, 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 we're all, these, all the answers to all these questions is going to be revealed. So go ahead and come on in, take a seat. Uh, I'm going to pass this off. So why don't we just give Cheng a big hand. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, yeah, so first a little bit uh, about my background. Uh, my academic background is from uh, number theory and uh, distributed computing. Um, and then I joined the crypto space. Uh, my focus right now is a uh, sharding project. It's called the uh, RFU. Um, we are trying to deliver a um, uh, decentralized and uh, uh, lightweight uh, scalable blockchain with very fast uh, uh, core shared transactions. Uh, so in this talk, I'm going to first uh, give a short overview about the um, Existing like research has been done by other projects, for example, Ethereum 2.0, uh, and also some other similar projects, uh, uh, with a highlight on the problems. And then I'm going to show you how um, our other few our projects uh, is trying to solve it, uh, resolving all the op open problems in the field. So. Um, here is a single blockchain, let's say it's uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum, and we want to improve the uh, transaction throughput. Um, probably you ha all of you have heard about the like, scalability uh, trilemma. It says that uh, if we want to scale the blockchain, uh, we need to sacrifice uh, one of the three dimensions uh, to some extent. Uh, so. Actually, if we look it a bit deeper, uh, there are m uh, much more things we need to, uh, or much more dimensions we need to consider and the trade off uh, for blockchain. Uh, so here is a more uh, academic model uh, to analysis blockchain. Uh, so we, we usually say is a uh, blockchain is a state machine replication system. Uh, for a, a state machine replication, it has three parts data, execution, and the uh, consensus. So data part, it uh, has quite a lot of constraints. Uh, we need uh, um, like some assumptions about network bandwidth, and also network topology is important. It's a P2P or it's a little bit more centralized uh, with different type of nodes. And then it's about the execution. So in blockchain, the execution is, uh, first you have the uh, state tree, uh, in Bitcoin is the UTXO set, in Ethereum is the wallet tree. And so here uh, there are some uh, limitations of bottlenecks. Is, uh, first is the IO uh, bottleneck. Then the second part is the uh, executing model. Uh, I uh, assume that the, all the commands are executed sequentially or you want to support the parallelized uh, execution of commands. Uh, the third part is about the consensus. Consensus, uh, we need to model uh, to first assumption, uh, give assumption about networks. Uh, some of the projects assume is a synchronous network. Some of the projects assume is a partial or synchronous, even a synchrony. Uh, and also security model, we assume like uh, majority, honest, uh, um, majority honest money or majority honest hash power or etc. Uh, so the last, uh, most important part is for consensus, we have the liveness and the safety trade-off. Uh, we cannot get both. We have to do a trade-off here. Uh, so actually, scaling blockchain is a, a, is a very complicated topic. Uh, we have um, seen a lot of uh, different proposals. Usually when they say we can achieve like a, a 1 million TPS, uh, they did not tell you like uh, some of the dimensions act actually, uh, or some of the assumptions actually sacrificed a lot. Um, so here is uh, some method to scanning blockchain. Uh, we first have the centralized exchange. Uh, so it definitely could improve the transaction throughput a lot, but the security model is uh, sacrificed, right? Uh, and uh, also large blocks. 
uh, large blocks could help a little bit, uh, uh, for example, uh, to scale uh, Bitcoin. But the, uh, the sacrifice is like uh, the network assumption. Uh, the network bandwidth, also network, uh, uh, you want it to assume it to be a synchronous network or it's a partial synchronous network. It will uh, affect the delay. Uh, and also, there are some methods I will not go through it. Uh, but sharding is uh, still considered to be the one of the most uh, promising way to um, to s scale blockchain. Uh, why it is like this? Because sharding is the way to scale blockchain by parallelize uh, data execution and the consensus uh, in the same time. The subtext is we want to achieve this by uh, very few uh, sacrifi uh, by sacrificing very few the other stuff, for example, network assumption, uh, for example, the security model, we want to keep it the same. I if we want to scale blockchain, we want to make it still decentralized. We want to make, uh, assume that it's still correct uh, with honest, uh, like uh, uh, majority honest uh, hash power, uh, something like this. Um, so, sharding has been uh, researched and investigated for quite a few years. Uh, uh, as you, we have all, like almost all people in the field must have heard it and also noticed that the progress is not uh, uh, very well, especially Ethereum, uh, Ethereum 2.0 got uh, delayed quite a, uh, quite a lot of years. Um, so here uh, I'm going to give a short review of the uh, popular, uh, popular methods that is behind the uh, uh, the uh, Ethereum 2.0 and also some other similar projects uh, and uh, uh, discuss about the problems. So here is a, a very simplified uh, like uh, picture to uh, demonstrate the, the idea of sharding. So basically it's like uh, we in Bitcoin Ethereum we have just one uh, blockchain and here we have a set of a number of blockchains and the, the miners, they don't focus on one chain, but instead they focus on uh, all of the chains. The problem here is the miners are distributed to uh, different shards, then the security uh, is uh, decreased for each shard. Uh, so the, the idea to solve uh, the, um, the popular method to solve this is using POAs and uh, validated sampling. Uh, the basic idea is like uh, we have a big chain, we maintain a set of uh, validators, mm, and then we use a randomized algorithm to uh, distribute these uh, validators to different shards. Uh, so here comes the first assumption of this approach. Um, you see, the assumption is basically like this. We have a large set of uh, validators, and we assume that the validator, uh, the uh, like major, uh, like a very high rate of the uh, nodes actually are honest. It's not just a majority assumption uh, anymore. Uh, actually, if you want to assume that it's uh, pretty safe for each shard, you need to assume that around the, like uh, 70 percentage or even 80 percentage of the uh, validators are honest. Uh, of course, it depends on the uh, size of the validators. Uh, another thing is. If the size is not big enough, actually it's uh, pretty insecure. If like you, in the beginning when you start a project, if you only have like 200 validators, actually uh, you, you can basically say like it, it can never be secure. Uh, so I, I will not show you the uh, proofs, but uh, uh, basically this is uh, um, one of the assumption and uh, uh, actually this assumption cannot uh, hold in short term and also in long term because uh, staking uh, service will uh, become a thing. A lot of users, they don't want to um, run a node by themselves. They will delegate the staking to a staking service. And this will make the assumption also questionable. Um, and this is uh, another even uh, critical security issue with this uh, is uh, something called the adaptive adversary. It means uh, when you distribute the validators randomly to different shards, actually, once the validators they are assigned to a shard, then you can try to bribe the validators in this shard to make an attack. 
Uh, this is very, uh, very doable, actually, um, if you give incentivization, uh, incentives to the validators. Uh, by using, for example, a smart contract, uh, you can autom uh, automate this process. It's, it's very, like, um, in practice, it's very doable. Uh, here is a very simple example. If you have 100 shards and 50% uh, of the tokens are staked, actually, for each shard, you only need to you have 0.5 person you stake in to uh, attack it. So this is uh, uh, also a problem. Um, another problem is about uh, uh, shuffling because, as, uh, as we say, that we need to distribute validators to uh, randomly to the nodes, and then after uh, Apple, because of the security uh, issues, we need to reshuffle it to make it sure. To make sure that uh, the validators are not uh, in the same shot. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, so the problem is shuffling actually has quite uh, some overheard because when you switch from one shot to another shot, you need to sync the states of the new shot, right? So this means you need to download this. Uh, if you only download the latest uh, state of Bitcoin, you need to download like several gigabits. Uh, this ta will take quite a lot of time, given um, depends on the network assumption. Um, so here the problem is if we try to uh, shuffle it too frequently, then the overhead overhead is too high, right? If we shuffle it too like uh, not not very frequently, then the security is uh, an issue because. Uh, the validators are kind of static for like half a day or for one day. Then you can basically, if you want to attack it, you can uh, you can take some action uh, in just one day, right? Uh, there are some ways to uh, easy this problem. One of the uh, uh, solution is to uh, use stateless clients. Uh, stateless stateless clients is. Uh, uh, good way to solve this, but the problem is stateless clients is not very practical for the moment. Uh, for Bitcoin, there are quite of, uh, a lot of researches, but still it's not practical. And for Ethereum, it will be uh, even more tricky because the smart contract is, uh, is more complicated. So right now, uh, Ethereum ha ha is doing some research using Merkle tree proofs uh, for this, but uh, they are quite a bit overheard because the Merkle tree actually the depth is pretty high. Um, so whether we can have practical stateless clients in uh, in the near future is also open problem. Uh, so let's assume on the previous uh, run uh, the validator run uh, sampling is uh, acceptable. Uh, then let's say we want to do a uh, transaction between the shards. How can we do it? So in this model, uh, in, in, in the existing approach, people usually use uh, the so-called two-phase commit protocol. Uh, basically, it's like uh, Alice in shard A, first, uh, if, if, if she wants to transfer money to um, Bob in shard B, it first needs to create a receipt. Uh, so here, he, uh, she first creates a transaction to say that, ah, I want to uh, like, uh, debit uh, this amount of token this or this amount of money, um, and uh, I want to send it to uh, Bob in Shard B. Um, once this transaction is got committed, uh, committed into Shard A, then in Shard B, uh, Bob could use a proof of the receipt to claim the money. Uh, it in, uh, so in this way, it has to uh, at least two steps uh, or two transactions used, but in in, in practice, actually, is even more complicated because the uh, gas fee stuff um, and also security issues. Uh, here, I only uh, talk about one of the issues is about the uh, dependencies uh, of the transactions. Mm, so because right now, in, in Shard B, the transaction uh, of Bob actually depends on the transaction of uh, Alex in Shard A. Um, so this will make if because uh, each shard actually could have forks. So uh, then the forks will have uh, complicated dependencies because of cross-shard transactions. And we need to take, a, take care of this. Uh, if we have like 1,024 shards, the dependency graph could be uh, like uh, very uh, chaotic. 
it will be um, very hard to resolve the uh, correct dependencies. Uh, there are some ways to do to solve this, but not perfect. The first, the first way is um, we try to arrange the shards in a, a di directed acyclic graph. For example, in a tree, then uh, whenever you receive something, you uh, you you don't only check the data uh, of your shard, you also check the data in your neighborhood shard. Then in this way, you can validate actually the um, cross shard transaction. Both sides is correct. Um, uh, uh, so this w um, this method is uh, the first uh, is proposed by Vlad, um, but it has some issues as well. Because uh, if you have a, if let's say if if you have a transaction from A to B and to C, then basically C cannot validate the original transaction from A, because A is not a neighborhood of C anymore. Uh, yeah, so here is uh, it kind of solves some more problem, but it does not solve it uh, completely. And the second is like um, you do just don't handle it. Depends on the finality algorithm. Some of the system uh, can like claim that they can never have forks, but POS. Uh, this uh, I personally, I'm a bit uh, skeptical uh, about it. Um, besides this. Uh, we still have uh, two very critical issues with um, sharding. So the first the issue, both of the issues are also related with the uh, dependencies. Um, the first issue is uh, state uh, validity. So it means if something bad happens in one shard, uh, it's very hard for the validators in another shard to uh, notice this. Uh, there are some ways to to solve this problem. Uh, the first one is called the uh, Fishman uh, uh, by Pockdot. So basically, it's like uh, you have another can type of nodes. It try to monitor the network to check if the there's something weird happened uh, in the state. And then once they found it, they they try to uh, punish it. Uh, but this has some issues because it will introduce some delays into it, and also. Um, Still, there are small uh, some timing window you can take uh, advantage of. Uh, the perf perfect way to solve this is using uh, zk proofs to prove that something actually happened in that shard. Uh, it's a bit like uh, the one I said before, stateless clients. Uh, but zkb, as I said before, zkb for stateless validity is also not practical. Um, the, the another problem is data um, availability. Um, so in in this architecture for of Ethereum 2.0 or uh, Neo Chain or uh, other similar uh, sharding uh, methods, uh, they always have a main chain. So the main chain, it will not download the other blocks from the other shards. It will all only download the block head of the shard. So in in this case, the validators actually they can uh, crude for a shard and produce one block, but they only uh, disclose the uh, d they only disclose the block head to the big chain, so big chain will commit it. Uh, but actually, the sh uh, the validators they never uh, disclose the full block. This this will make the uh, block not available. Uh, it basically can can make the system hot. Uh, yeah, so we have seen quite a lot of open problems in the. Uh, current uh, approach. Uh, I call this approach as POS plus uh, validator sampling method. Some people call it uh, as uh, commit-based uh, protocol or uh, approach. Mm, so what is the issue of this approach if you want to say, describe it in one sentence? Uh, so basically it's transferring uh, from the don't trust verify approach to the don't verify uh, trust approach. So in, in Bitcoin we uh, or Ethereum we download all the blocks and we do the validation and if something weird then we uh, don't just reject the block. Uh, but in this new POS plus uh, validator sampling approach uh, is not um, like this anymore. You have to trust the validators. You have uh, you have to. Uh, trust also the assumption that in the sh uh, in each shard actually no more than th uh, one third of the validators are, are malicious. 
and then you trust what they verify for you. Um, so in the end, each shard actually is a, is a light node or is stateless node. Uh, but we actually, even now today, I don't think like we have a, a practical, mature enough light node uh, that you can have very high security, uh, like a full node. Um, so I think, yeah, this, I, I'm, I'm not saying that this uh, approach is totally uh, wrong, but uh, it's still like uh, in the research progress and uh, uh, many open problems need to be solved. Uh, yeah, so now I would like to show you um, how we are going to, uh, to do this, in, to, to, to do sharding in uh, RFU. So we proposed a, a new um, algorithm is called a block flow. Uh, that's our sharding approach. Uh, so basically, there are s several uh, points I want to uh, highlight first. So first, we still follow the don't trust verify approach. Uh, this is, I think this is um, critical and uh, um, important to, uh, to keep a high security. Uh, the second thing is we use POW and the UTX uh, model. Uh, actually, this gives us a very lightweight design. I will explain later. Uh, the third point is uh, in our system, the cross shard transaction just need one step. As I said, that's in in the existing uh, research proposal, is always uh, two step uh, like uh, commit protocol. Uh, in it will affect the user uh, experience. Uh, we, all, we, we have a complete solution for sharding. It's not like research in progress. Uh, we are developing this for quite a long time and we have an alpha system. Uh, yeah, so it's kind of, uh, we have a, a proof of concept already, yeah. Now let's show you how, how we do it. So first we uh, use UTX model. We um, first, uh, divide the odd addresses randomly into G groups. Uh, in this way, the transactions, uh, because transactions could happen between any two of the groups, right? So they are G times G uh, possible types of group uh, of transactions. For for example, in the left graph, we have nine types of transactions from A to B, A to C, A to A, etc. Uh, we build a blockchain for each one of these types. So in total, we have G times G uh, chain, right? So what's the uh, beautiful thing about this, uh, uh, this kind of uh, decomposition? So the first uh, uh, good thing is, if you want to do a transaction from group B to group A, we just prepare the transaction just like what we do for Bitcoin and we commit it to the chain corresponding to the age from B to A, right? Then it, it's done, we don't need to have two steps. Uh, the second thing is about, um, so now for group B, it does not need to download the transactions between A to C and the C to A, right? Uh, because that's not relevant for, uh, f for, the, uh, gr for group B. And so in this way, the amount of data uh, a single node need to save is reduced to uh, one over uh, around one of G. Um, but actually, the the main challenge is uh, the you know the data dependencies between shards, and uh, uh, with this, it's very hard to uh, reach consensus. You can you can consider it uh, uh, as like a forked system. Uh, so we propose. Uh, a very specific algorithm called a block flow to resolve the uh, forks and uh, to reach a consensus. Uh, I'm not going to go to details. Here is a, a very uh, conceptual description. So basically, it's, uh, every new block, it will select very spatial hashes uh, as the dependencies following very specific rules so that uh, guarantee that uh, the first thing is guarantee that there's no um, kind of, uh, how to say, invalid, invalid dependencies. Because for example, if, uh, if one transaction depend, depends on two forks of another shard, this is invalid. So we, we basically should uh, 
like forbidden this kind of uh, dependencies. And then the second thing is like we should make sure that this uh, kind of uh, dependency selection is efficient enough uh, because otherwise we can simply choose the latest uh, hash of all the other shards. But this is not efficient and it, it, is, it also has other uh, uh, drawbacks. Okay, so once we have this uh, specific uh, dependencies data structure, uh, each new block actually could de determine a unique flow of blocks. It's like a net, uh, as, uh, as you can see in the left graph, it's like a, a network flow of uh, blocks, right? So each uh, new blocks using these dependencies to depend a unique uh, flow of blocks. And then we uh, simply choose the best uh, flow based on the uh, the POW uh, proof of work weight. Um, so now for the nodes, they need to validate the dependencies and uh, also uh, uh, transactions. The dependencies validation is something uh, something new compared to uh, to to Bitcoin or Ethereum. Uh, so what is the cost? The cost is. Uh, so first, we need to take time to compute, uh, use some algorithm to compute the dependencies data structure. Uh, the calculation could be uh, very used very fast heuristic in most cases, um, and the uh, validation is quick. The, uh, it's much faster than calculation is. Uh, like uh, like even I remember it's two seconds for uh, for g equals 32. Anyway, it's very very uh, two milliseconds. Anyway, it's very fast, um, and also we need to have uh, more space to stop these dependencies. Basically, it's uh, it's uh, several hashes, uh, and uh, actually we can move this to the block body, uh, and uh, just um, uh, include them in the Merkle tree, and then and then for the light clients it's not a big deal, and for the full node, this G dependencies is quite uh, uh, negligible. Um, so, in case that uh, if you uh, are not familiar, very familiar with the technical uh, details of sharding, so here I want to uh, convince you, like uh, conceptually, why this approach could work. So, uh, the first way to look at it is we uh, this method is actually um, a, sh a shift from state machine replication to state class replication. Uh, state machine replication is uh, just a single blockchain, and here is like we first have uh, we first decompose the ledger to be stored in a small cluster, and then we replicate this cluster, uh, and the size of the cluster we um, we are increased from very small uh, to large gradually. This makes totally sense uh, because. When the market cap of the blockchain is very small, actually we don't need to uh, shard it quite a lot, right? Uh, and then later, when the adoption increases and the market cap increases and the hash rate increases, then we can increase the uh, the size of the cluster. Um, and the, actually, in our algorithm or architecture, it's very uh, uh, easy to increase the the size of the uh, cluster. It's, it's, it's not that uh, hard. Uh, it could be very dynamic. Um, and uh, the last point is uh, because it's a replication, so it is still follows the don't trust uh, but verify approach. So we don't have all the problems uh, uh, from the POS plus validate uh, sampling method. We don't need to trust the validators, we only trust ourselves. Uh, and also in in some cases you can even if but this is optional you can even trust your friends you can connect to your friends to form a for, for ledger uh, I think this is uh, mm, much more like uh, acceptable than you trust the random validators I mean but this is optional you can still uh, run a very small clusters because in the early days when market cap is very uh, very low, the cluster is like you can even hold it with one node if the if your if your computer is powerful enough, or you can decompose it to run like uh, several lights, a very uh, very cheap uh, nodes in Amazon. It's fine. Um, 
uh, another way to look at this approach is we can um, uh, analogy this to the computing model. Uh, we all know that the computing model evolves from uh, sequential computing to concurrent computing, basically multi-threading, uh, and then distributed computing. Uh, you have a set of computers. Each computer could do concurrent work, concurrent computing. So in blockchain, actually, we have the single blockchain, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and then we have uh, some proposed DAG-based uh, blockchain. Uh, but actually, uh, most of the DAG projects are not uh, designed properly. And block flow is, you can see, is a distributed uh, DAG blockchain. So it's very uh, much like the distributed computing evolution. Uh, and this is also give us, you know, we kind of learn from history, uh, give us confidence. That's why it makes sense. Um, yeah, that's that's all. Uh, and and uh, if you are interested interested in more about details, you can um, go to visit our website or follow follow me in Twitter. Ask me questions later. Um, and tomorrow I I have another talk about how to reduce the energy consumption of proof of work. So uh, if you are interested, in, please come to uh, uh, to have a look and uh, ask me questions. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Cheng. We don't have time for questions, but he uh, will you be able to take questions off stage over here? Yeah, sure. yeah so he's going to be over here. Uh, if you would like to ask him some questions, we're going to get set up for our next talk, which is Monero Bitcoin Atomic Swaps. That's a big buzzword. Everybody likes to say atomic swaps. Um, so we're going to get that set up. We're going to be back here in a couple of minutes. Um, yeah, stuff was going down, huh? I'm oh, pretty interesting. I don't, I mean, it, can't be C3 without at least one something or other going down. So um, we'll be back very soon. <laughs>